Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Lee Montville, and I'm with Springer Publishing Company here in New York. We are thrilled to have you join us today for today's webinar, The Art of Reflecting in Action When Addressing Issues of Race and Racism in Nursing, featuring authors Sandra Davis, PhD, DPM, Ace. C A G N P B C F A N A N P and Anne Marie O'Brien, PhD, MSN, M A, W H N P B C. Um, before we begin, just a couple of quick housekeeping things. If you have any questions for our authors, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, my colleague Gina Marie Mar Martinez and I will be mon monitoring the chat and we'll ask our uh, distinguished um, speakers, those questions. Um, the webinar should go about, should last about 40 to 45 minutes, including question and answer. Again, please feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A. We're thrilled to have you join us today. This webinar is also being recorded and will be disseminated within um, seven to 10 business days after the uh, recording. So you will be receiving a copy of this recording. And uh, again, thank you very much for joining us. So I'll go ahead and introduce our two distinguished um, speakers today. Sandra Davis is Deputy Director for the National League for Nursing, Walden University College of Nurse, Nursing Institute for Social Determinants of Health and society, so Social Change. Prior to joining the NLN, Dr. Davis was Associate Professor and Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, DEI, at the George Washington University School of Nursing. Dr. Davis is a board certified AGMP and past president of the NP Association of the District of Columbia. She is an AACN Wharton Executive Leadership Fellow, a Leadership for Academic Nursing Fellow, a Fellow in the AANP, and an inductee in the Temple University Distinguished Alumni Gallery of Success. Anne Marie O'Brien is an Assistant Professor at Gwyn and Mercy University and Research Fellow at the Center for Public Policy, Drexel University, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She was previously a clinical assistant professor at the George Washington School of Nursing, where she also served as the director of the ABS, ABSN Clinical Education. Over the last 30 years, Dr. O'Brien has worked for and with community organizations, academic institutions, and health systems in the belief that we can more effectively address racial and health inequities when we bring together our unique life experiences and expertise. And so without further ado, I'd like to um, invite our speakers. Thank you, Dr. Davis and Dr. O'Brien. Lee, thank you very much for the introduction. Good afternoon and welcome. We are delighted that you have joined us for our webinar on the art of reflecting in action when addressing issues of race and racism in nursing. Next slide, please. As nurses, we can lead the transformation of healthcare so that every person has the opportunity to live their healthiest life possible. There are multiple complex and interwoven factors driving the need for healthcare transformation, with health inequity being one of the most pressing. We know that racism is a root cause of health inequity that requires our urgent attention. This is why we want to be with you this afternoon to share this topic. Now, over the next 40 minutes or so, we will first discuss why it's so important to talk about racism. However, we want to not only emphasize why we must talk about racism, we want to also demonstrate what taking action looks like. Therefore, we will identify strategies for reflecting in action when addressing racism. In addition, 
we want to highlight your critical role in leading as a nurse. Therefore, we will talk about developing the skills to facilitating honest, difficult, and uncomfortable conversations. And then we'll explore potential activities for teaching and learning in a group setting. Next slide, please. As a nation, through the Healthy People initiatives and in research in healthcare and academia, we have been focusing on health disparities and inequities for the past 30 years. Yet, the unnecessary and the avoidable excesses in morbidity and mortality among racialized groups has not significantly declined. We have been addressing disparities and inequities, but without acknowledging racism as a root cause. Prior to May 25th, 2020, we really think about it. We really did not talk about racism. However, with the murder of George Floyd and racial injustices happening at the same time as the COVID-19 pandemic, with, with its disproportionate impact on communities of color, our nation is now showing the willingness to acknowledge and, and to address the devastating and harmful impacts of racism. Next slide, please. So this brings us to a defining moment in our history. Silence, ignorance, and avoidance on this, this issue are no longer acceptable. In our book, Dr. O'Brien and I talk about this defining moment in history where we are poised at the nexus of reluctance and resistance, truth and reconciliation, and healing and transformation. How do we? That's the question. How do we move out of reluctance and resistance to address racism, right? We need to move out of, move past the reluctance and the resistance because we've never talked about this. And then move into truth and reconciliation so that we can have hope, transformation, equity, and justice. Next slide, please. Moving out of reluctance and resistance involves first engaging in dialogue about racism. However, I realize that we are all at different levels in terms of our knowledge, our experience, and our willingness to engage in discussions about race and racism. No matter where you are, though, if you have not started talking about racism, or if you are doing this consistently in your teaching, learning, and workplace environments, this really is an ongoing active process where you are constantly discovering, learning, growing, teaching, naming, disrupting, challenging, and building your anti-racism practice. Next slide, please. The Future of Nursing Report 2020-2030 states that nurses are uniquely positioned to lead in advancing health equity. The report also says that in order to advance health equity, nursing education must rapidly transform to develop, implement, and evaluate interventions to address racism. Next slide, please. So first we have to be very clear about what racism is. And I use the definition by Kamara Jones, a family physician and epidemiologist and past president of the, the American Public Health Association. And so that definition is racism is a system. That's important. It's a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks or what we call race. And so as we go through this, I want you to think about this. So it says racism is a system. And what does it do? It structures this system, right? It structures opportunity 
and assigns value based on the social interpretation of how one looks or what we call race. And that unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities and unfairly advantages other individuals and communities. And it saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And so this definition defines racism as a system. And it says that we are all in this together. So this is how we come into these conversations about race and racism. Racism saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And so you might ask, if racism is a system, what about the overt races and explicit actions that happen between people? Dr. Kamara Jones says that racism is still a system that gets mediated through people by differential assumptions about the abilities, motives, motives and intents of others based on race, which is what we call prejudice, and the differential actions based on those assumptions, which is what we call discrimination. But then we have to think about larger societal systems and structures. And this is where the terms systemic, structural, and institutional racism are used interchangeably. However, there are differences in the terms. Okay? And so that was reflected in the poll. So we use them interchangeably, that's okay. But I want to emphasize that there are differences in the terms. Now, structural racism emphasizes the role of structures, laws, policies, institutional practices, and entrenched norms, right? That's structural racism, that's the scaffolding. And then systemic racism is how discriminatory actions against racialized groups show up in whole systems, such as our educational system, our healthcare system, our system of criminal justice, right? So structural, systemic, and then institutionalized. Institutionalized racism is on the level of your institutions and your organizations, okay? So let's move to the next slide. To discuss racism, we must also understand that race is a social construct. It's a human invention. It's a social, political and legal construction. It is not biologic. The Human Genome Project completed in 2003 demonstrated that we are more alike than different and that we share 99.9% .9 of our DNA in common. Now, this is very, very important for us as healthcare professionals. Very important because Inherent biological inferiority was taught. It was taught through scientific racism. And we still see these harmful and erroneous assumptions today in practice. And we see them through race-based corrections and clinical algorithms. And we also see it showing up in the undertreatment of pain in Black pe people who are Black, Black people, right? Now, we must, next slide, please. We must also understand the history of the nursing profession. And so we have to understand the history of the nursing profession from a broader socio-historical perspective and how nursing developed within the context of larger systems and structures of colonialism, racism, and oppression. The nursing profession has a history of exclusion and marginalization, and that legacy persists today. Now, as the most trusted profession, some might believe that racism, racism could not possibly influence our actions. However, racism is a key determinant in shaping the education of nursing students and in influencing the perspectives and the behaviors of nurses who are educators, researchers, practitioners, clinicians, and leaders. And so recognizing racism 
analyzing and critiquing inequity and oppression, and then taking, taking action starts with you. And so this is where I'm going to turn the present over, presentation over to Dr. O'Brien. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Davis. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Everything's good. Uh, so as Dr. Davis said, uh, one of the first things that we can think about as uh, fellow nurses, a calling that we have to our profession is reminding ourselves of the definition of nursing, which is part of our, our social policy statement, and it still guides us today. And so when we think about nursing and what is nursing, it really is the protection, promotion, and optimization of health and abilities. It's also the prevention of illness and injury. It's all about, and this is what's really important when we think about our patients and how they're experiencing the care we give them, is that we want to pay attention to the alleviation of suffering through the diagnosis and treatment of the human response. And that includes the response to the care that they're receiving in our institutions. And just as importantly, and especially as we look today about the power of nursing and what we can do with the future of nursing, as well as the new National Commission to address racism in nursing, is to think about advocacy in the care of individuals, families, communities, and populations. So what are some ways that we as nurses can join the efforts of the National Commission? And as Dr. Davis said, it all starts with you. And, and we want to start here because that's really where the reflecting and action skills come about. We know that at the heart of it all is that interpersonal relationship between the nurse and the patient. Um, but please know as we're talking about this, that we also want and expect that nurses will be part of changing organizations and systems and structures. So again, one of the things that I, uh, my big heroes is Hildegard Peplaw. And she really reminded us so long ago that as nurses, we need to be a maturing force. And so part of being a maturing force and an educative instrument is that we need to think about what we can do to help promote healing, as Dr. Davis was talking about. And so uh, I also just want to give a shout out that I was listening to two episodes of the Nurse Keith show that they invited commissioners from the National Commission to Address Racism, and I thought those are both really good summaries. Uh, but one of the things that we uh, learned is that the charge before all of us is how do we learn to dialogue with each other? And when we think about something as charged as, as race and racism and uh, how we are feeling, maybe we've talked about this before, maybe we haven't, is that this is where one of the most important things we can do to be a therapeutic self is to build on our self-awareness. And a Swedish social scientist, Dr. Jordan, um, outlined in 20, or 2001, a three-stage developmental process to self-awareness. And the first one that he talked about was the stage of noticing. And in noticing, we're in the moment of asking ourselves, just simply, how are we feeling? What are we feeling emotionally, physically? What are we thinking? You know, what, what's being provoked? Um, thinking about, am I feeling good about this? Am I feeling uncomfortable about this? Am I feeling confident about this? But it's the notice is the first step, step in recognizing our thought processes and just noticing them. The next one is as we build in our self-awareness of being in the moment is recognizing that our thoughts, our feelings, our beliefs are in the moment. And we can recognize that it's happening. And we can ask ourselves, these are thoughts, these are feelings, these are beliefs. But who am I and what am I doing right now? I am there to take care of the patient. I am there to recognize these are thoughts and feelings. These are who I am. I accept them for who they are. And I may need to just put them to the side right now and then nurture, examine later. But ultimately, as we build our self-awareness, we get to this third stage in this process of self-awareness, which is a much higher level. And this takes a lot of time. Um, but hopefully we can get to this space where we can be therapeutic by developing a non-attachment to some of our thoughts, beliefs, and thoughts that we're 
prior biases, uh, ways of thinking, uh, ways that we we lived our life, our love, our lived experiences that were maybe traumatic to us. Uh, but developing this this full self awareness is developing non attachment at the moment to what is happening, and that is part of developing your maturing force and in order to be a therapeutic nurse. And so the skills involved at the moment he also talks about is again, this noticing and reflecting again, it's simply saying, what am I feeling? How am I feeling? And I, I just, I'm recognizing that this is happening to me right now. And I want to just remember this so that when I'm later, um, after my shift is over or after the class is over, I can use this feelings and beliefs and do some reflecting on action. But in the moment, um, it really is about recognizing and noticing. And then in this second stage, it's what do I, um, why do I feel like this? So the evaluating, again, if someone is very advanced in self-awareness, they might be able to answer that question in the moment of why am I feeling like this? What has happened to me in the past? What's happening um, that's making me to feel this way. But is this really reflecting my oath and my values and beliefs as, as a nurse and what I want to do and bring to the profession? Um, so again, this evaluating in someone who's very advanced self-awareness might be able to do all this metacognition. But again, um, these skills take time. And this is really one of the things where what we found in a lot of, of um, research is that developing self-awareness comes from mindfulness practice. And there's uh, many opportunities for nurses and, and there's now apps available where we can cultivate that skill of noticing and then evaluating. Um, because the final stage of skills involved is the transforming. And this is when, again, we've come to this space of we've really realized that what we were noticing and evaluating maybe isn't reflecting who we are, um, but these are ego processes. Um, again, uh, something that I want to try and change. I want to do better. And so this is where in that transformative stage um, and skills, this is something that you would probably do more in the reflecting on action, but they are all tied together. And uh, one of the things that Dr. Jordan, I thought had a really great idea is when we think about transforming is pushing ourselves by reading about religion, reading about anthropology, reading about history. Uh, sometimes it's simply having what I've had my, my last four years so grateful to Dr. Davis, who, you know, we have very different lived experiences and she is a very safe person for me as I share with her, you know, the ways that I grew up and the ways that I thought and the ways I want to be. And so um, having someone who has a different lived experience with you, um, um, Dr. Jordan also knows this can be a really good way for helping us transform. So again, in these reflecting and action skills as a, as a process, also as we think about when we're maybe in a group setting, whether it's in our professional practice or in a learning environment, is again, as we can reflect in action by first just recognizing that thoughts and feelings and assumptions have arisen. Um, that's just the awareness that, that that's happening. And then the next step is thinking about, and what's happening now to me? What's happening in my mind-body response? And one of the things that's an important concept as we talk with each other is this idea that um, Daniel Goleman first introduced in 1995 about the amygdala hijack. And as part of our emotional intelligence and our ability to be our full therapeutic, um, effective quality nurse is recognizing when the amygdala hijack happens, he defines that as that moment where we're having a fight or flight response. We're having a perceived threat. And then that perceived threat to self, um, there's a trigger that's happening. And so again, a part of this process of our mind body response that can be further developed and honed in, in mindfulness is just being aware of it and recognizing that that's a natural response um, but we need to do something about it if we're going to stay therapeutic. So at that point, when we recognize something's happened and maybe we're having this negative um, thoughts and feelings and emotions, it's the importance of recentering. 
And so one of the ways that happens as we build our, our self-awareness, our being in the moment of recentering, a lot of times it starts with breathing. It's remembering to breathe, remembering to see why you're there. What is the mission, vision, and values, not just of the organization and who you represent, our, our profession, and why you came to be a nurse. And so this recentering of what is going on may come to be again, where you come back to recognizing these are emotions and feelings that I'm probably going to need to process. And it's caused a negative feeling in me. Some people may jot something down in the moment um, and be willing to share. And some may need to wait and talk about it and debrief later. But we also wanted to make sure that we recognize that there will be times as you're trying to recenter that you are just in a space where it is very traumatic. Um, you're feeling that you don't have the skills that you need and you need to seek assistance. And that's a really important thing to accept of yourself. And part of these, these reflecting in actions as you're going through these, these steps is perhaps having these conversations ahead of time with your unit, with your colleagues, so that when you do seek assistance, you have all developed this, what we might call crew resource management. You've got language to use. They're recognizing that you're seeking assistance and here's why, and they're there for you. And um, so these are, again, just some examples of reflecting in action skills. So um, an example of reflecting in action practice is one that Dr. Davis and I were, were reflecting on, and it was in our book. Um, but it, we wanted to just give this quick example for you of how you might do reflecting in action if you were in clinical setting. So imagine that you were in a racially discordant nurse-client relationship. And the client has just interpreted your rushed, distracted manner as being racist. How would you react if they accused you of being racist? Would you be offended or become defensive? Would you take a moment to breathe and to reflect before responding? Would you then have the moral courage to sit down and frankly acknowledge the patient's feelings and seek to understand? Depending on the situation and the time constraints, at a minimum, it's important that we take a moment to recenter ourselves, allow us to refocus on the patient in front of us, and figure out what we can do to restore their trust in you and the team, and ultimately get to a place of having the patient feel that they're safe and valued and are going to receive safe, high-quality care. We can also reflect on what those roles would be reversed if you sense that a client was racist toward you and how would you feel and respond? And this situation could be used in a simulation setting where learners have been formally pre-briefed and the importance of psychological safety has emphasized. But ultimately we hope to get to a place where we can have that seek to understand and having the courage to dialogue with each other. So strategies for facilitators, and again, this starts with building our own work on knowledge, attitudes, and skills in addressing race and racism, which Dr. Davis started um, this conversation with us for today. And it really is a big conversation. And when Dr. Davis and I were faculty together, we saw the need for dialogue between our faculty, students, and staff. And that prompted us to write an article that we called about Let's Talk About Racism. And it was a way for uh, nurses and nurse educators to really think about how they would build those skills, as well as how they could facilitate the learning process for their colleagues and other nurses through a case study. So again, we start with our own work. As we're building, and it is a journey and a process, but as we build it, they may then try to identify what resources we want to use as learning opportunities. And then as we get those resources together, we have to really ensure that it's setting up the ground rules, the expectations, the psychological safety, so there is a safe and brave space to talk about these things. And, and we can't emphasize that enough. And then finally, um, Dr. Davis is going to talk about this in more detail about what it means to have courageous leadership. So 
Uh, in our book, in, in chapter five, we do talk about a self-reflection exercise of situating the self. And I'm not going to go into full detail um, for sake of time, but really what it is, is a reflecting on um, looking at ourselves in the ecosystems of how we grew up, how maybe we're trained as nurses, how we situate ourselves in our organizations and institutions and our communities. And so um, it's just a question of really asking yourself these hard questions about how you think and feel and believe and why is that. And so um, some other things that, again, probably when you have time, uh, maybe you'll go back and, and look at this webinar, but we did want to share with you some really good activities and resources we found very helpful. And my experience as an educator that students really resonate to this uh, video on looking at cultural humility. Uh, Vivian Chavez in 2012 did a wonderful job of interviewing Drs. Trevelon and Murray Garcia. And what the students like about cultural humility is that it takes away that shame of the fact that we recognize we all have biases. We all have um, experiences of assumptions and that that starting point becomes a lifelong journey. The amygdala hijack and strategies for addressing that, again, Dr. Goldman has some really good short videos for that so that you can explain to the students what this can mean when you feel that fight or flight or that um, feeling uh, perception of threat. Creating space for dialogue, a 10 minute video by National Geographic for teachers is about breaking down barriers. It's with young adults who are um, a young woman, a black woman, a white woman talking about their differences in growing up and it's, it's really fabulous. And a lot of these um, tools are also in our book in the last chapter uh, with some questions and prompts to help educators. Recently, we also saw that um, International Association for Human Caring and just published in, I believe, September, social justice and caring modules for, for educators as well. And then um, again, looking at the National Commission to Address Racism in Nursing and all those resources there, including the stories of women and other um, nurses, men who've all ex talked about what their experiences were and Project ECHO is on there. And finally, the NLN Walden Institute for Social Determinants of Health and Social Change. So again, we wanna help our learners understand the process. We look to Mazaro and Mazaro's transformative learning and taking theory to practice. So we could start by inviting our students to reflect on this, this idea of, we do not make transformative change in the way we learn, as long as what we learn fits comfortably in our existing frames of reference. So we're going to encourage them to be disoriented, to, to begin to question and to begin to think more deeply. And finally, self-reflection can lead to a significant self-transformation. So creating brave spaces, one of the things that we've also found very helpful is something that comes from the Center for Medical Simulation. And the Center for Medical Simulation says that um, this is an assumption that you could read before the beginning of every group as you sit down and talk to each other, that we believe everyone participating in this or activity is intelligent, capable, cares about doing their best, and wants to improve. And that's something that we have to stop and pause and have them recognize that we really need to believe this in that space as people begin to be vulnerable. And so again, hopefully where we come to all of this is inclusive excellence. And um, we want to make sure as we look to diversity, equity, and inclusion, that we also move to a space where we are creating for our students, our colleagues, this idea of ensuring belonging. And anti-racism is an act. It's an act that was really summarized well by um, Dr. Tony, who said that we need to be upstanders, not bystanders, but upstanders. And so that's what anti-racism is, is being able to stand up and speak up. And again, Dr. Um, Davis will talk about that a little bit more. But ultimately, where we hope to get is this place where we are benefiting as a society, every individual, this opportunity for inclusive excellence. And the Commonwealth of Virginia has a wonderful template for strategic planning within organizations to look at what does inclusive excellence look like, how do we measure it, and what do we do to get there. So some parting quotes um, for reflecting in action 
is um, thinking about what the ANA has said to us in their commission, which is this is a journey. And as nurses, we need to unlearn what we thought we knew about racism and get comfortable with being uncomfortable about our profession and our way of being. We need to see nursing through a new lens and be open to what we might see. We also need to look to Brene Brown, who talks about daring to lead. And I love this quote from her about keeping it awkward, brave, and kind, and being kind to each other as we're going through this work. And finally, I recently saw a quote um, in Vandy Fair of all places, but it was, Dr. It was uh, Gloria Steinem talking about what we can do. And she said, never mind what's happening at the top. Change grows from the bottom like a tree. And if you treat others as you would want to be treated, if you do what you love and say what you mean, you will create the revolution you want to see. And so I'd like to finally turn this over to Dr. Davis um, to talk about courageous leadership. Thank you very much, Dr. O'Brien, for those excellent, excellent strategies, the actions. What is it that we can do? And so we are all nurse leaders, and it's going to take courageous leadership to think and act differently. As you can see, this is very different. We're at this defining moment. We have to do something different, something new to address racism, inequity, and move toward equity. And our, we need to be intentional about this, okay? And so courageous leadership, what is that? What does that involve? It involves accountability on our part, um, accepting the responsibility for this new way of be being, for our decisions, for our actions, and that we must answer to them, right? So building, building that, building relationships, that's what's important, and setting a foundation so that we are all in this together and we're supporting each other through this. And then also transparency. And so operating in a way that's easy for others to see and for easy to others to understand and know what you're doing. And this takes communication. So communicating constantly, communicating with others, with our colleagues, with our learners about this whole process and what we're doing and what it takes. And then authenticity. And see, that's where we're moving to our truth. Uh -huh. Authenticity, how do we show up as a leader? That's knowing who you are and being true to yourself. As Dr. O'Brien said, it's knowing your values, right? And having that moral courage and how do you show up? And so in summary, next slide, please. It all starts by, first of all, we have to. We have to increase our knowledge about history and about racism so that we understand the how and the why. We're not just giving statistics, but we are explaining and giving the how and the why about why things are the way they are. So this again, what is it connected to? It's connected to our teaching when we talk about and teach about the social determinants of health and the structural determinants of health. Okay? So we can see now how this is all connected in connecting our past to our present so that we have a full understanding. And these are very intentional actions so that we are not just saying words, but we are actually doing. And so if you were listening to Dr. O'Brien as she was going through and following her and going with her and thinking about, you know what? This is going to take me doing something very different. This is going to take me leading my colleagues, my teams, my students to realizing and recognizing there's a different way that we need to be. And it's becoming, right? And so our next step is practicing self-reflection reflection, and knowing who you are. Who are you in all of this? And how, once again, how are you going to show up to lead? And then next, engage in the ongoing reflecting in action to discover, to learn, to grow, to, to disrupt, 
and to challenge. And then be ever so mindful, ever so mindful of your teaching, learning, and work environments. Mm -hmm. What actions are you taking? How are you role modeling? How are you critiquing? <coughs> Excuse me. How are you assessing? And how are you challenging? Excuse me. <laughs> and so we must lead with courage and lead with humility because we know that we have so much to learn and that we are all in this together. So there's no shame and no blame. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Thank you, Dr. Davis and Dr. O'Brien. Um, for any everyone who's attending today, please feel free to write any questions you have in the Q&A. We also have a couple of uh, questions already, so I will go ahead and read those. Um, one of the questions that came in was, how did the two of you start your work together? So... I was very fortunate while I was a professor at GW School of Nursing that Dr. Davis was the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And I really, I didn't even know her. I knew though that she existed. And so when an issue came up in class one time um, related to discrimination and bias, I sought her out to ask her for support and what we thought we could do and, and how do we um, help students to learn and grow. And so that's where the work started. And then as we began to speak about um, some shared experiences we had, but also different life experiences, she invited me to be part of the work she was doing. So I was um, very lucky to be part of that. Yes, and thank you very much for that question. And uh, as Dr. O'Brien said, it's a wonderful journey. It's a wonderful journey when two people are able to really let down their guard and get to know each other and get to know your truth and the other person's truth because that's life giving. And so I thank Dr. O'Brien for being my partner in this work. Well, and, and Dr. Davis had this wonderful lunch and learn program that she had for staff, students, and faculty. And these lunch and learns, she would invite us all to come and share parts of our lived experiences, um, our backgrounds. For mine, it was my, my grandparents who were immigrants and some of their issues around health literacy and um, but also celebrating the culture of the Newfoundlanders. And so what it came to be was us seeing that when you bring people together and you give them those spaces to talk and share, uh, that you begin to create that safe space. And so that led to an article we wrote together and then uh, deciding that we really wanted to do some of the work we had been doing uh, at GW and, and build that as a fast facts uh, for nurses who are both in clinical practice as well as those who are in academia. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. And to that end, actually, uh, another question that we have is, do you have any quote unquote lessons learned for facilitators to help a diverse group feel safe, comfortable talking in front of each other? And I'm sure from your experiences, you probably do. Dr. Davis, do you want to start or you want me to start? Oh, you can start. Thank you. Uh, sure. So I think, again, uh, what we've found is the most important is that um, what we do in simulation, it's the same thing, is really doing a pre-brief, um, a setting up of psychological safety. Uh, Dr. Davis uh, cited some work that Glenn Singleton has done, but it's really setting up ground rules. And in some ways, it's also preparing people similar to showing the video um, of Dr. Goldman and recognizing that um, again, when we are talking about things that are just so very personal and uh, for some can be much more traumatic than others, it can be scary for others, that really setting up the expectation that we all are there to do our best and are capable. And um, so setting up that, that pre-brief um, of, of acceptance um, to encourage people to not feel that 
they're going to be judged for what they say, but learning to have acceptance and seeking to understand. So I think a lesson learned is absolutely setting that up ahead of time because otherwise people come into these spaces and they're not very comfortable. They don't know each other perhaps, or students, even if they do know each other, um, they may be afraid of sounding stupid. They may be afraid of hurting um, one of their colleagues or they may be afraid of reacting. So um, again, the more that we can not only help um, them to have those skills, but also role model that. Yes, Dr. O'Brien, thank you. And really it is about putting down the foundation and building the relationships. It's all about the relationships. And also I want to point out that this work is emotional. It's very emotional and you will bring your emotions and that's all right because this is emotional work. It's also very traumatic. And so we have to think about that and consider that. And so we we need you need a good facilitator because you have to take care of yourself and then also take care of others in the space. And Dr. Davis, to that end, uh, Phyllis Miller asked or mentioned she understands and resonate, reson, resonates with your emphasis on self-work work and self-reflection. But she's curious if either of you would have any suggestions for breaking through any expected resistance to this topic. She believes it's only to be expected that anyone on this journey will encounter resistance since this is often hard work to do. Yes, absolutely. And um, Dr. Millis, Miller, yes, Phyllis, thank you so much for that question because this is going to be a journey. And we have to realize that it is not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen immediately. Right? But when we encounter the resistance, right, there are a number of strategies that we can take. And it all depends on your environment, um, who's involved, uh, and, 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 and a number of factors that you really, really have to uh, think about and be strategic about. Uh, and, and so it depends, it is, it is situation specific. Um, and you have to know, once again, as I said, being strategic. Because this is not going to stop, right? It's not going to go away. But there are, I'm sure, within your organizations, there are people who will support you. And so you find the support and then you build from there. Uh, because we do not let the resistance stop us, but we have to have strategies for building relationships, building support, being very intentional, and then doing the work. And and Dr. Davis, I just want to add um, that was an excellent question, um, Phyllis Miller. Thank you for that. And I think um, one way that I've looked at it is similar to when we we talk, and it, and it's still ongoing in in healthcare. That when we say the patient's perceived pain is the pain, and it's the same way with when we're addressing racism and people are sharing their stories, it's the story and the story is real. And we as nurses, if we care about our colleagues and we care about our clients and our communities, then we need to be open to listening and seeking to understand. And so the resistance is encouraging nurses in our commitment to lifelong learning, that being open to what you think isn't there or doesn't need to be addressed is asking them about that commitment to lifelong learning and being open to thinking in new ways. And I would agree with Dr. Davis that we now have in our institutions, they recognize this, so use them as your resource. And that actually brings up a great next question, which is around 
the um, any suggested websites or resources that either of you have for helping nurse nursing students and our colleagues learn more about the impact of structural racism on both individual and population health. Thank you very much. That's a great question. The NLN has a initiative called Taking Aim. And on the Taking Aim NLN website, there is an entire um, microsite that has resources related to structural racism, implicit bias. And so that is uh, an excellent resource. And, then, and you can also go to their building it. But um, to go back to also the, the previous question and this one, there is a lot on the website now for the National Commission to Address Racism in Nursing. And so I would encourage people to go there. And again, for students, um, I, I really found that uh, listening to the podcast of, um, I have no, um, by the way, investment in, in Nurse Keith, but I really found for um, someone who's new to this work, that listening to the commissioner speak uh, was very powerful for me. And I think a really easy way to introduce people to then go to the website, see more resources. And then we always have the CDC, the National Institute for Minor Minority Health and Health Disparities. I mean, there's so much out there now, um, but those are just a few that could be very helpful. And another question we have in the chat is from Monica, should combating racism within nursing be separate of other DEI initiatives within an organization when there is resistance? I love that question. Thank you very much, Monica, for that question, because there's so, there, that's, let's look at that and let's uh, think about that. So we've been doing DEI, right, for a very long time uh racism right? racism is something different right anti-racism is something different um can it be done within a dei initiative uh, so that's something that needs to be discussed and decided right and so we have to be very clear very clear about racism and talking about racism and talking about diversity, talking about equity, talking about inclusion and belonging and all of those things. And where do those things all fit in to what we're doing? And so going back to Phyllis's question, it's related about the resistance. Uh, so think about this. We have position statements. We have mission statements. We say that our work is mission driven. And so all of our mission, but really, where's the action and where is the intention and so if we take it back to our mission statement then we have to say well what are we really doing now what do we say this these are our words but how is that being um, actualized what are we really really doing and so in terms of dei we have different words and that's why I think we have to go within our organizations and have these conversations and be really clear about what are our issues, what are we addressing? Yes, we're addressing diversity. Yes, we're addressing equity. Yes, we're addressing inclusion. We're addressing belonging. We're also addressing anti-racism. And we have to say it for what it is and call it what it is and then decide. Are you doing DEI and what does that include? Are you doing anti-racism? What does that include? Are you doing JEDI? What does that include? But it's important that we have the conversation so that we can be very clear about racism and anti-racism and where does it all fit in? Well said, Dr. Davis, thank you. Thank you. And Monica said powerful response, thank you as well. So um, I think that's all the questions that we have today. Um, thank you for moving to the next slide. For anybody who's interested in purchasing Dr. Davis and Dr. O'Brien's book, um, we are offering a special discount, Webinar 25 at the checkout. So feel free to go ahead and um, 
and purchase it there using that special discount code. A copy of the recording of this webinar will be available within about probably within seven to 10 days and will be emailed to all the folks who have attended today as well as those who have registered. We're very grateful for both Dr. Davis and Dr. O'Brien for leading the webinar today. It was extremely informative. We thank you all of you who have um, stuck with us and have been here for almost a full hour. And um, we appreciate your support for uh, Dr. Davis and Dr. O'Brien's book. Um, if you have any other questions, please feel free to give us a call or shoot us an email. And we thank you very much and wish you a wonderful rest of the day. Take care. Thank Thanks, you. Everybody. Thanks, Dr. Davis and Dr. O'Brien.